Um, I apologize for not greeting all of you that know me more intimately than those that you have never met me. But I will say that our Father in our Father's house connects us all. Um, Pastor Clark has clearly indicated that there is a bungee cord here. (laughs) And more significantly, that there is a source of the receipt of the Father God through his Holy Spirit that is present here, not because of any person, but because of the welcoming nature of his sons to receive him. And as a result of that, you have heard it said before, but I'm going to reiterate what he said again. There are sparks that have carried up through the spiritual realm of the fire that is here that have spread to the nations. And as he and I have talked over the last several nights, there is going to be a manifestation of that that will amaze us all. And we have to be prepared for it. I love you and hope that you have the opportunity to reciprocate because I'm blessed by being here. And I'd like you to now welcome our Pastor Jay, that he can come and present the word of the Father to us. Test, test, test. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Well, before we bring the word of the Lord this morning, we get a really fun thing that we get to do before that, and that is to welcome our newest addition to the Our Father's House family, Woods family. Would you please present your baby? Come on forward so we can all see him. There you go. That's good enough right there. <laughs> yes, he is. J- Joshua Scott Woods Jr. He is perfect. What a he is just a, a, a very handsome little guy. So Congratulations to you guys, and uh, we're all excited to have him as part of this family here. So, praise God. (sighs) Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, today is another edition in the series I've been doing for a little while. We've started story time. Yay! Yay! We've covered a lot of ground in story time, all the way from back with Gideon, all the way up to... Again, attacking a, a very well-known story, but how deeply we know the story is, is, is important. We're going to dig into it a little bit deeper. So if you're first time with us, or you haven't been here for a little while, what we do in story time is we try to find a, uh, a story that is well-known or... Sometimes it's little known, but something that we have a little light understanding of. Oftentimes it can be a kind of a Sunday school level of understanding that we've been, we've been hearing our entire lives, but we haven't ever really dug down below the surface. So we're going to dig down below the surface today in the story of David and Goliath. And I'm excited about this one. This is... Oh, I, was, I was telling Katie, I almost don't even know what to cover in this because there's so much here. So we're going we're gonna to start going through this, and I'm really I'm excited about what the Lord has for us today. All right, so let's talk about the time frame that this story is set in. We find it in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, covers the story of David and Goliath. But the time frame we're talking about here is 
approximately 1025 BC. So this is about a thousand years before Christ comes on scene. And the progression of history at this point, as far as Israel's concerned, is that Israel has been brought out of Egypt, right? Out of captivity there. They went 40 years through the desert uh, where God was weeding out those who, who really couldn't trust him to, to bring them into the promised land, right? So he rose up a whole new generation with Joshua and Caleb, the only two from the previous generation that were able to come into the promised land. They came in there and they conquered that land by the help of the Lord, right? Um, but after Joshua died, we come into a series uh, of time, or a, a, an epoch of time that is the time of the judges. And, and we went through, uh, through Gideon, we were talking about him, we talked about the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. That all takes place in that period of time. But as we come to the end of that time, somebody new comes on scene, and that is Samuel. Samuel is a prophet of the Lord, and he ends up really helping to rule the nation of Israel during that period of time of his life. And during that time, as his life is coming to a close, the people are calling for a king. They want a human king. They don't want God as king. In fact, God tells Samuel after Samuel, is like, are you sure you want to be doing this? Yes, we want a king, we want a king. And Samuel's feeling like, I failed at some level here, right? And God tells him, essentially, look, they have rejected me, okay? Give them a king and let them know what the terms are about what this king's going to do. And, and Samuel lays out for them, really, under no uncertain terms, he's going to take things from you. Your best lands, he's going to take. He's going he's to conscript your, your men into the army. He's going to do all of these things. We don't care. We want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. All right. So who does God give them? Saul. Saul, it is a tragic story when you read about Saul. Because he's so promising coming on scene. I mean, he's, he's prophesying. He's following the Lord. He's doing all these things. It's really a kind of a, a glorious way that he comes on board. But unfortunately, Saul ends up breaking down. He starts disobeying the Lord. He starts taking the matters into his own hands. He, he, he kind of cuts corners on things. And it's, it's a tragic story as you see Saul kind of uh, fall down. He becomes prideful. We find in 1 Samuel chapter 13, after Saul's been disobedient, Samuel says to him, You have done, this is chapter 13, verses 13 through 14, You have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So this, this happens scripturally about three chapters before David really comes on scene. That's chapter 16. But God talks about what it is that he's looking for, and that he's actually already found somebody, and that's David. Now David is not a grown man at this point in time. He's, he's still maybe even a child at this point. But... God knows what it is that he's building and who it is that he's building in this situation. And he's looking for somebody who is like him, has the same, shares the same type of heart. The final words of chapter 15, right before we come into seeing David, kind of signals the beginning of the transition to the new leadership on Samuel's behalf. It's kind of like a, an emotional break point for Samuel. So remember, Samuel comes in, and he's, he's seen all that Saul has done. He helps Saul come and worship the Lord, but then Samuel comes off and says, and Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. He killed him because Saul didn't do it. Then Samuel ref, left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. That's the end of that chapter right there. And you think about all Samuel had done trying to help Saul become a righteous king and rule over the people, and he just keeps seeing this thing fall apart. He mourns over him. Mourns over him. What a loss. All that emotion vested in this, and it's gone. 
So we come to Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 16. And this is the beginning of the next phase. This is where we start to meet who God talked about when he was saying, I want somebody after my own heart. And that I've appointed him. So what are the first words that God says to Samuel? How long will you mourn for Saul? So we have in that last chapter, he's mourning. First part of this chapter, how long will you mourn? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. This is my doing. I've rejected him. And then he tells him to basically come to action. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So here's the new promise already coming to bear. And he tells him, get up, load up, saddle up. Here we go. I'm sending you. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. So God tells him, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. This is a little bit of a different type of identification of the king than happened with Saul. God spoke to him clearly ahead of time what this, what this new king was supposed to look like and he was going to identify him. And, and even to the point that when Saul is invited into Samuel's home, Samuel already has food prepared for him. You know? So this is different. He's going in there and there's, there's a lesson that Samuel's going to learn in this process that is important for us to learn as well. So Samuel goes, and uh, we see when he comes to Bethlehem, the elders of the town tremble when they meet him. They're scared of what this man of God is going to bring. And they even ask him, do you come in peace? <laughs> yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. You know, when he sees Jesse's first son, he thinks, surely this is the king. Why would he think that? Firstborn son, he's handsome, he's tall. Remember, Saul was really tall. So Samuel's, it's, we fall into this. He's trained to fit the same mold. This is a replacement. It's going to look the same. No. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. And this is, this is the lesson to us. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. I'm not looking at how he looks. I'm looking for his heart. Remember what I told you? I found a man that I've appointed that has a heart like mine. That's what I'm after. Not the firstborn. So we cycle through, right? You know, like I said, Saul was, Saul was known for his height. One of the ways that, that he was distinguished among the people when, in his choosing to be king when they had the big meeting there, he's a head taller than everyone else. I mean, you got everybody, he's like head and shoulders, literally, above everybody else. And Samuel says, the man who is, who is king is unlike anyone else here. Look around. Oh, there's somebody who's unlike everybody else here. This really tall guy over here. And he was this great warrior. He did amazing things. So we see another son of Jesse come before Samuel. Abinadab. The Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Shammah passes by. And Samuel says, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So you've got to think. Samuel's sitting there like, well... I know one of your sons is supposed to be chosen as king, and the Lord has told me that none of these are. Aha, I know what the issue is. Are these all the sons you have? <laughs> well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Yeah, it's yeah, David. He's out there. He's tending the sheep, but nobody, nobody worries about him. You know. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. This just smells like the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> so cool. So he sent for him. 
and had him brought in. I love this. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. And he's the kid, right? He's literally the one off to the side watching the sheep. Then the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So we know already from what has taken place, that there's, there's something about this guy that's different than the others. And this line about tending the sheep, this is a recurring pattern that you see in his life. And it should tell you something about the heart of God. And we're going to dig into some of that here today. Okay? So he anoints him in the presence of his brothers. And I'm sure they're all excited about that. <clears throat> You'll hear some of that frustration later. Um, and it says the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day forward. So we know that as he was anointed, God really showed up for him. This is a significant thing in this, in this household, in this family. They're, they're, they're witnessing what's happening here. And David ends up getting called into Saul's service because Saul ended up having, having a, a harmful spirit that was coming upon him that was tormenting him. And really the only relief that he found was in music being played for him. Turns out David's a really great harpist, right? Um, do you think the Lord might have set that up? I don't know. So David starts getting introduced to Saul. There's a, one of his servants says, Hey, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. All great qualifications. Bring him in. Let's get him in here. And he started playing the harp for, for Saul. Whenever Saul was being tormented, David was there playing and, and soothing him. And there's something about the spirit that David carried that, that brought, you know, pushed away all the other spirits that were coming after Saul. It's a powerful thing. Really powerful. So then we come to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So this is, this is the story. So I wanted to give you that backstory because it's important for understanding the context of what we're stepping into in this story. Because God is raising David up and it's, there's been a little bit of, of an undertone going here, this initiation of his, uh, his relationship with Saul, which becomes quite tumultuous, but David is coming on scene in all of this. And this is kind of the big sign to Israel that something is different, something has shifted. And that's the story of David and Goliath. So we enter into this battle that's going on. It says the Philistines are gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Soko and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. The scene is set. You picture it all in your mind, hillside, hillside, valley in between, and they're ready to come to battle together. Now something happens in this battle that's pretty uncommon in the rest of Scripture. We have one-on-one -on -one combat. We have champion warfare that shows up here. And this is something we see more in, like, in, in Greek culture. And if you look into where the Philistines come from, they actually come from the Aegean. And it's they're bringing with them this type of warfare that is kind of actually foreign to this area. And it is psychologically demoralizing to this, this whole group. Okay, So this champion named Goliath from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. Now, the description of this guy is really powerful. His height six cubits in a span. What does that mean to us? A cubit's about 18 inches. That brings him in about 9 feet, 9 inches tall. Okay? He had a bronze helmet on his head, wore a coat of scale armor, a bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That comes in at about 125 pounds. 125 pounds of just scale armor on him. He had, uh, on his legs, he wore bronze greaves. Greaves are... Like what soccer players wear, right? Chin guards, right? He had metal ones. This guy's just enormous. He had a bronze javelin slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, so it's like eight feet plus long, right? Huge. And the iron point weighed 600 shekels. 600 shekels. I mean, isn't that a lot? 
How much does this show? Okay, I'll translate for you. It's 15 pounds. We were in Dick's yesterday, and I picked up a 15-pound weight. I said, hey, Jack, carry the, hold this. this is, that's Goliath's spearhead right there. That's the end of this thing, right? Think about the, the enormity of somebody who can wield something like that with precision. Whoa. It says his shield bearer went ahead of him. Can I get a chair real quick? And Jack, can you give me my water? It's right underneath the chair there. Jack, my water's under the chair. Thank you, sir. This next part's going to get a little bit loud. <clears throat> so, mommies with babies, uh, I'm just going to prepare you. This is going to be a little bit, a little bit loud. If I could get up on the the back here, verses eight through, let's do eight through ten, put up on the screen here. So, I came in here yesterday with my boys and measured this out. This is Goliath's height. Stand up real quick. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Goliath today. <laughs> now, you're looking at me. I do not have the enormity of body that Goliath had, but this is the eye level that David and the nation of Israel are facing. Okay? Like I said, this is going to get loud. Because it says here, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. You ready for this? Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man. And let us fight each other. I'm coming in a little over a buck fifty right now. Okay? I don't have that arm span. But think about if I had a spear in my hand that was the size of a weaver's rod, and that thing had a 15-pound pointy weight at the end of it. Do you think you're going to get in close to me? I mean, I might even be able to hit Barb right here. <laughs> right? How are you going to face somebody like that? And those are some strong words. Wait, uh, the fate of our nation hinges on one person going against this guy? Put up the next verse, please. On hearing the Philistine words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and what? Terrified. Who on earth are we going to send against this guy? Remember, Saul has been known as a very tall individual, very imposing in battle. By the way, he's about 58 years old right now. He's not the young man he had been. He's much older, and he knows, I can't match this guy. You know, you've seen when like the bully in the class comes up against the new bully in the class, or he goes from... Uh, elementary school into middle school or middle school into high school, suddenly, I'm not facing that guy. This is a completely different league. And this goes on for quite some time. So David, back on scene now, he's coming between his father's house and the Philist, or the the Israel, Israel army. And we find out that for 40 days, Goliath's been coming forward every morning and every evening doing this exact same thing, and nobody's answered this yet. Because there's nobody that 
Well, Saul's not going to do it. Who are they going to put out there? This just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> Forty days it happens. So, Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance of them. Make sure they're alive, please, and let me know. There was Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David leaves early in the morning. I think it's interesting that it puts this, uh, this statement here. Left the flock in the care of a shepherd. See, David didn't just up and leave. God's still talking about his character. He's, he has responsibility over these sheep, and he's not going to leave them unattended. So he finds another shepherd, and he leaves them with them. Everything that's in here is strategic. Don't, don't just read right over the stuff and gloss through it. There is important words in the scripture. So he goes out there, reached the camp where the army is going into battle positions, shouting the war cry. He comes right when this whole scene is about to happen again. Israel and the Philistines are drawing up their lines facing each other. And David leaves his things with the keeper of the supplies Runs down to the battle line and asks his brother, how they're, how you guys doing? Things going okay over here? Dad's asking me, you got like some sort of token I can take back, make sure that you're all okay, because he's going to ask me and I, I want to answer honestly. And as he's talking with them, Goliath the Philistine champion from Gath stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance of what you just heard. He shouted again, and David heard it. Oh, this is exciting stuff. Come on, this is exciting stuff. And David heard it. Everything changes now. Every, every single thing changes now. You have an entire army of Israel that's been hearing this over and over again for over a month, right? 40 days this has been going on. David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. This is the behavior of sheep when they're presented with a predator. Keep that in mind. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. I'd like to not pay taxes. <laughs> so David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Do you hear this guy's heart? This is, this is a youth, right? This is a youth. He's not... He's not in the battle lines, which means he's under 20, okay? Depending on how you run the math and what evidence you look for, he's somewhere probably between the ages of 15 and 18. This is what's standing before him, defying the armies of God, right? And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? David is personally offended. He was the schmuck. <laughs> How long has this been going on, by the way? He is personally offended. These are strong words that he's using. He's offended at the defiance that Goliath is presenting about the Almighty God. Remember what Goliath said? I defy thee. This day I defy so they repeat to him again. This is what will be done for the man who kills him. So David's older brother shows up. This is the oldest brother, Eliab. Tall, dark, and handsome, Eliab. <laughs> Not king of Israel. <clears throat> Not anointed king of Israel. He burned with anger at him and asked, 
Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few, those few sheep? Not big, you're small. Those few sheep in the wilderness. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You only come down here to watch this thing. You're not involved in this. You don't care. Right? I'm sick of you, David. And David, like the perfect youngest brother, what have I done? <laughs> Can't I even speak? <laughs> Turns around. I'm not talking to you. He turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So Saul sends for him. Something's stirring in the camp. Someone's not happy about what's going on here. Somebody might want to do something about this. So he's, he sends for him. I love this. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Now, he's young. So you might just think, He's cocky. Is not the case here. Absolutely not the case. And you'll find that in this next interaction here. So Saul replies, You're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. You're just a kid. This guy's been killing everybody for years. You can't go up against this guy. You're completely outgunned here. I'm not putting you in the battle. Not with everything on the line. One-on-one champion warfare. This response David has enough to convince Saul to take note of what has, is said here. Okay? I've read over this many times. We're going to read into this. Read, really read down into it. <clears throat> but David said to Saul, it's the first statement, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Period. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. He's talking about his natural father. I've been keeping my father's sheep. Example. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Have you ever chased down a lion or a bear to rescue anything out of it? So I went over there, grabbed it, and pulled it out out of its mouth. That was the end of it, right? No! When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? Because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Take note of all these words. They're so powerful. He's drawing analogies here. And this is the basis for why he's stepping forward in this. He's not looking for a fight. He's here to deliver grain, cheese, and bread. And bring back tokens to prove that his brothers are still alive. He didn't come looking for a fight. He found one. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, who's acting like a bunch of sheep right now? The entire army of Israel is being scattered by one man's voice over and over and over again. They are carried off right now. So what do I do? I go after it. I strike it. I rescue sheep from the mouth. When that thing turns on me, I strike it and I kill it. I've killed both the lion and the bear, and this guy is the same. Why do I know I will be victorious? Because this isn't about his size. It's not about his stamina. It's not about his strength. It's not about his capability. This is about he has blasphemed God. 
And because it wasn't just my ability out there fighting the lion and the bear, right? Who rescued me? The Lord rescued me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, and now the paw of the Philistine, the hand of the Philistine. He's going to rescue me out of there. The only reason any of this has happened and I've been successful is because God has been with me doing that because I am carrying my responsibility with excellence, tending and keeping my father's sheep. I'm going to take a sidetrack right now. Do you think when he was fighting the lion and the bear, he thought that someday this is really going to train me well for when I face Goliath of Gath, the Philistine? <laughs> No, he faced each training moment that he had and allowed the Lord to enter into it with him and carry him through. And he was trained by each one of those situations for this battle and what was to come beyond it because this is the first time we see David at the national scale. Okay? Do you have lions and bears in your life? The title of the sermon, by the way, Lions, Goliaths, and Bears, Oh My. What's interesting, the next, the next line is, Saul says to David, go and the Lord be with you. Have you ever thought about that? He just said, you can't go against him. You're a youth. He's been doing this since he was a kid, killing everybody. And now he says, go and the Lord be with you. Why would Saul allow this? Yeah, kid, I get it. You've killed some lions and bears. Uh, the entire nation is on the line right now. Thanks. Go home. That's not what he said. Why did he allow that? The whole kingdom is on the line right here. You see, Saul knows what it is to have the favor of the Lord and to be used by the Lord. He, he recognizes that God is afoot here. Something's different about this. Even though he is not able to carry it out himself, he has been himself empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he recognizes it. That's at least my, what I'm positing here. But it's funny because he goes right away and says, all right, David, <clears throat> here's my own tunic. So he's honoring him. He's come take my stuff, right? Wear my tunic. Here's my coat of armor. Here's my bronze helmet. Here's my sword. Puts that all on him. Come step in, because this is how we do this thing. Right? David puts it all on. <laughs> no, this isn't going to work. <laughs> that may have been well and fine for Saul, but it's not well and fine for David. That's not what's going on here. And there's some lessons in that, too. And David says to him, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. This is not his way. This is not how he's been trained. This is not how he carries himself. It's not what's going to happen. So he took them off. And he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, Approach the Philistine. So he didn't waste a lot of time going out and answering this. Five smooth stones. <clears throat> I didn't bring it today, but I have a stone sling that my dad made for me when we were kids. And my brother and I would go out. We had a kiwi tree in our house back there in California. And kiwi trees can produce a lot of kiwis. More than we could eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner and more than we could give away. So we had a basket full of old rotting kiwis, which are perfect for throwing at the stone sling. Smooth, round, you can really whip those things out there. A stone sling can throw something well over 100 miles an hour. And the types of stones that David is using are uh, a little under the size of a baseball, if you think about that. And these, this weapon is actually, it's prehistoric, but it is still being used today by shepherds because it's, it's accurate, it's effective, 
And if this is all you got, you can get good at using that thing, right? So he's using his shepherd's implements here. He chooses five smooth stones from this from the stream. You want something smooth when you're thrown with a stone sling because anything that's wonky goes wonky when it flies. You want something that's aerodynamic and you can really control that thing. David is very selective in what he does. What I think is interesting here is that he f- chooses the five smooth, smooth stones from the stream. It doesn't say he went to a riverbed. He actually takes them up out of the water. I think that's symbolic. He goes to the stream, goes to that living water, and he pulls the stones up out of the stream. And he picks five of them. Why? I mean, this is a specific number. It didn't say he just grabbed some stones and threw them in his bag. He chose five. There's a lot of, a lot of thoughts about why it could be five. One is that, well, he had some extra some spares and go out there to hit them if he missed. I don't think that's the case. I've got a, a different theory, and I'll get to that, but... And I didn't come up with this theory, by the way. I'm just going to share it with you. I think it's the right answer because you would have four remaining at the end of this. We'll get back to that. I think David was so confident in the Lord that he chose five stones. He had such great confidence in the Lord to kill one man, he chose five stones. We'll get to that. So, meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. Oh, man, this is good stuff. Okay. What does he say to him? Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Remember, he's got his, his shepherd's staff with him, right? He cursed David by his gods. This guy just won't shut up. He just keeps coming, right? Cursing him by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Come here, boy. And here's what, bug, this is bugs me. When you hear these renditions of this stuff, David's always this, I'm going to get you. You defied God. Come on, he was, he was so, oh gosh, you got to love this guy. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I'm preparing this, and there's one point I'm just telling the Lord, man, I just, I see why you like this guy. He's just cool. He's so cool in his humility and his recognition of who he is. So Saul just, or Goliath just tried to blast him, right? Taunts him. Come here, boy. I'm going to feed you to the birds and animals. And again, we can read right over this stuff. And here's what David says to him. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down. And Okay, he's prophesying right here, right now. Listen to this. This is prophetic, okay? I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistines to the army, to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David met met Goliath's taunt point by point and just destroyed him. Okay? This isn't just... Yeah, you're going to get me. Well, I'm going to get you. It was not that. This is not what he's doing here. Oh, oh, this is good. See, David identified, remember what Saul said, my dog, they come at me with sticks. Here's your weapon. You've got a stick and you're coming at me. David said, you're coming at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. I'm not coming at you with stick. He identifies his weapon as what? Being in the name of the Lord Almighty. It's not about the stick. It's not about the sling. 
Not fully. It's about what he's doing in this moment. His weapon is who he is in. You think you're going to get me with this sword and stick and javelin? I got one for you, buddy. <laughs> Goliath sees the earthly weapons, but David is functioning on, in the spiritual accounting of the event. They're all seeing the natural, all right? Everyone else involved in this scenario shares Goliath's perspective. You can't win. I am way bigger than you. I'm going to kill you, and we, I'm going to feed you to the animals. That's what's going to happen right? Everybody sees that except for David and likely Saul. Because he was willing to put him there, he recognizes God is going to do something different here. That's, my, that's what I think. David is functioning on a completely different plane at this point. Okay? This isn't just David and Goliath, big Goliath, little kid. This is David, upcoming ruler of Israel, functioning as a spiritual authority in this situation. He sees everything on a completely different uh, plane. In fact, he's not even playing Goliath's game anymore. I don't know if you picked up on that. He's not even playing the original terms that Goliath put out there. Goliath said, you win, we become your servants. I win, you become our servants, right? David says, I'm going to kill you and we're going to kill all of you. We are going to annihilate you. This isn't about us taking you in and you become subjugated to us or anything like that. No, I'm not playing this game anymore. You've defied God. You've blasphemed him. We're wiping you out. So David just reestablished the terms of this interaction. I love this guy. I'm not playing your stupid game. I'm up in the ante, by the way. Goliath was focused on the single combat. Not David. He didn't care for any of that. He's not taking any any prisoners here. He's annihilating them. So, the Philistine moved closer to attack him. He's coming after him. All right, let's do this, right? He moves closer to attack him. What does David do? He, come on! He runs quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaches into his bag, grabs out a rock, (laughs) slings that thing. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. Was this guy's whole uh, forehead exposed, by the way? No, what was he wearing? A big bronze helmet. Your target just got smaller, right? David's not standing still. What's he doing? running. This guy is, he is demonstrating exemplary skill. I remember my dad teaching me one of the most demoralizing things you can do on the field of battle is one shot, one kill. That's why snipers are so effective. You kill one guy and you've just eliminated the psychological integrity of everybody else that's out there right now. You don't know where that shot came from, but it's devastating when it happens. David just sniped this guy while running with a rock. I saw a really interesting History Channel episode about, good David, I've really killed Goliath. And they actually have, you know, this champion stone slinger try to do the same thing, and he hits, he hits a, a mark that's about this big, which they say is probably about the amount of exposed area that Goliath had. And they said, can you kill him with a rock around the size of what was probably used back in those days? And surely you can kill him. It says here, the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. When I was in Sunday school, that was the end of the story. David won! Look, he knocked him over and killed him. That's not all David talked about that he was going to do, did it? Uh Uh-uh. Oh, man. That shot took incredible skill, even for an extremely skilled slinger. uh, That's really hard to do. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. But once he did that, 
what did he do? He went over, grabbed Goliath's sword, and he cut off his head. Can you imagine how big that... When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. This is where we see prophecy coming to pass immediately. They turned and ran, and the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath into the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Just like David had told them was going to happen. I'm not just killing you, Goliath. All of you will be delivered into our hands. Our hands. David was acting on behalf of Israel, and then Israel, they followed his lead in the pursuit. This is a huge change in the shift of how things were going. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. He proved, I killed this guy. He's dead, by the way. And now I've taken this trophy to show you all. And he kept the the weapons in his own tent. So let's get back to why David chose five stones and why that demonstrates his trust in the Lord. Remember, he had that incredible shot, killing Goliath. But why four stones? If you go further in Samuel, and again, I didn't, I'm not the one who uncovered this. I'm just reporting what I believe is, is likely here. If you go further into Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15 through 22, we see a note here about wars against the Philistines. And in this sec- section here... <clears throat> we find out that there were other giants afoot. This is later in David's life. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels, that's half Goliath's spearhead, by the way, and he was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. And David's men swore to him, you're not coming into battle with us anymore. We don't want the lamp of Israel to be extinguished. In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Shibakai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, one of the descendants of Rapha. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, with a spear, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. In still another battle, which took, what are we up to now? That's three, right? In still another battle, which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingered six fingered man. <laughs> so great. Six fingers, one on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty four in all. So he couldn't do how many year old are you? This many. He also was a descendant from Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimea, David's brother killed him. These four were descendants of Rapha and Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. These are four other giants from Gath. How many stones did David have? Five. Left over? Four. I'm thinking he's seeing the playing field out here and says, I'm ready to take these other guys down too. There's no scriptural evidence that they were there at that battle. But I'm looking at these connections and thinking... Knowing this guy's character and his confidence in the Lord, utilizing his abilities, I'm thinking he was prepped in case he needed to take down some other giants that day. The very end of our our chapter here in, in 17 gets back to recognizing Saul saying, whose son is this? And it comes out when he asked David, whose son are you? Son of your servant, Jesse. Right? David is known by his father. His identity is with his father. This stuff is so good. There's so many layers to all this. So let's talk about some takeaways. 
David's approach to this battle was different than everyone else because he saw the battle for what it was. See, this guy had the amazing capacity in that moment not only to recognize God's complete control over the situation, but the, to have confidence in God's ability to use his ability to accomplish great things. Katie and I talk about this as, you are enough because he is enough. You are enough because he is enough. He's in you. David saw the battle for what it was. And he was fully submitted to God, fully recognizing that he had a unique role to play in this unfolding drama. Remember, he was there delivering food and bringing back tokens of assurance. Instead, he turned the course of history because he stepped into the void that was left because God had prepared it for him. And he had prepared him to step into it. He'd already faced lions. He'd already faced bears. And David could draw the analogy and say, this is the next lion and bear. And I'm going to be victorious. Not because I'm a pugnacious brat who got anointed a while back, and I know I'm going to be king, but because this is an issue of blasphemy, and God is going to bring punishment right now, and I am the instrument of that punishment. I can't go wrong here. David came into the battle with unconventional weaponry, right? Seemed a little out of place for the physical battle. Yeah, it does, until you consider, again, he said, I'm clothed, I'm here, my weapon is the, the Lord God Almighty, I'm inside him right now, I'm functioning under his headship right now. But his weaponry is really significant. He didn't come into the battle as warrior, he came into the battle as shepherd, because this story is about David exemplifying God's heart, right? He came in with the weapons of a shepherd. And when you see it from the perspective of God keeping his sheep, remember these guys are scattered, God keeping his sheep, who's he going to keep them with? He's going to keep them with the shepherd. So what's on display here? The shepherd and the shepherd's ability to protect the sheep. Shepherds don't run around with chain mail on or scale armor or bronze helmets and swords. They have a staff and he's got the stone sling. So really, the weaponry that he brought into the battle was perfect for the situation. This isn't you brought a knife to the gunfight. This is a knife fight. It also demonstrates how God confounds the wise with foolish things. Everybody was looking at this all one way, and it was all the wrong way. It took one man to say, see it for what it was. This is also an issue of old wine skins and new wine skins. David's new wine coming in, he can't wear that, that armor. It's not going to work. Everything's going to fall apart. What's going to happen? Both the armor, the wine skin, and the one wearing it, the wine, is going to be destroyed in that situation. And that's not what needed to happen. He's coming into a new season. Things are different here. His approach to this battle is different on the order of the fall of Jericho. When we see the fall of Jericho, when the, the Israelites come into the promised land, they're not told to go storm the gates of the city. These guys had had some battles and they'd been doing well. But God, after they moved in there, he said, we're not doing things like before. You're going to march around this city a while. I'm going to bring the walls down. I'm going to do this unconventionally. You're going to show that you rely on me. What did David, David say? I'm not going to kill you with those other stuff. We're going to know that there's a God in Israel today. And he did exactly that. This is on the order of that. It's showing a reunition, reuniting and a realignment with the heart that says we are dependent on God for our victories in battle. The battle is his, not ours. We're coming along with him, and God was bringing punishment that day. God brought forward the one who had a heart like his, and it's the heart of a shepherd. <clears throat> this is fun right here. Jesus who is both the lion and the lamb, is exemplified in this story. 
See, all this stuff, when we go back into the Old Testament, we follow these stories through, they're all starting to point towards Jesus, right? Whose line is Jesus in, naturally? The line of who? David, right? David is his ancestor. By the way, if you're in Christ, David's your ancestor too. This is, this is your spiritual heritage here that we're talking about. Which means what? You're inheriting these traits when you come into Christ. Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. Fierce in battle, humble before God. Jesus came in the line of David and brought down a Goliath in his time that we all benefit from. Jesus brought down the Goliath that was what? The penalty for our sins. He didn't just launch a stone at the mind of the enemy. He was and is the stone that brought down the whole giant to the ground. Come on. The stone that the builders rejected, right? He launched himself right at the mind of the enemy. He didn't even see that thing coming, just like Goliath didn't see it coming. You've got this humble servant who comes from modest upbringing, right? Modest background. He's not a king. He's not a king, right? He's a carpenter. He's a shepherd boy. Launched himself right into the mind of the enemy and destroyed it. Explodes out of the ground three days later, demonstrating his victory over death. (coughs) Victory over sin. He paid the price for everything you did, are currently doing, and will do. Because as lost sheep, we need a shepherd to rescue us from from the jaws of death. Sheep can't rescue itself from the jaws of a lion or the jaws of a bear. What does it need? A shepherd. We weren't designed, equipped, and we do not have the ability to rescue ourselves from our own sin and the penalty for that sin. Only one can do that, and his name is Jesus. Like David, he rescues us out of the jaws of death. If you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior to bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life in a restored relationship with your heavenly Father, because this is about the Father's sheep. Who was David keeping all those years? His Father's sheep. Who did he keep there in Israel? The Father's sheep. We are lost sheep who need a shepherd to bring us back into relationship with our Father, God. What are you waiting for? If you've not accepted him, what are you waiting for? You can't do this on your own. You can't do it. But you can choose to say, Jesus, be my king. Draw me back into that relationship with God. Let me be like you. Come live inside me. If you've not done that, I'm going to invite you to come forward today to receive Jesus. If you're facing a lion or a bear in your life right now, maybe you're facing your Goliath right now, I believe there's grace for you today for the Lord to bring and, uh, and give you strength and clarity and perspective in that. Recognizing that he's in you and he's already won the battle. The victory is his. You just get to walk into it. He's equipped you specifically for everything that you're facing right now and that you're going to face in the future. He's building you. He's strengthening you. You're joining him in that battle in your life. And the abilities and gifts that he's given you are things that he is doing so he can put himself on display in that situation. If you're facing that this morning, I'm going to invite you to come forward at the end of this and spend some time at the altar with him. Ask him, Lord, what perspective do I need? Do some time with him. Because if you're facing Goliath, remember who your great, 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 granddaddy is. And know that that blood is coursing through your veins today. That's all I have for the morning. 
Get into your Bibles, folks. If you're not already, get in there, hang out in a portion of Scripture, and dig. There's so much good content out there and commentaries in these study Bibles. You can get in there in full threads, and I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit will light that stuff up for you, and He will show you how this living Word is real and true and influences your life right now. It's relevant to everything you're going through. All right, stand up. I'm going to pray for you guys. Father, I thank you for your heart, heart of a shepherd watching over your sheep, us, your children, your sons and your daughters, Lord. Lord, I ask right now that if there are those here who have not yet made that commitment to come back and run back to your house, Lord, that you would draw them forward this morning. You would tug on their hearts, Lord, and they would say, yes, Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to submit my life to you. Save me, rescue me from the jaws of death. Lord, I thank you for what you did through David and how we benefit from that victory. Lord, I ask right now that as, as we're facing lions and goliaths and bears in our own life right now, Lord Jesus, that you would come and meet us in each one of those moments, in each one of those intricacies that would come and try to terrify us, Lord, that we would hold on close and tightly Lord Jesus, to you, knowing that the battle is yours and we get to walk into victory with you. I thank you, Lord. I ask for a special, new, fresh outpouring of power and the authority that we are walking in in Christ, Lord, as we face battles this week. Lord, I ask that you would show us in real and true ways that as we step out, knowing, Lord, that it is your battle that we are fighting along with you, that we would see victories taking place, and Lord, we could testify of what you have done in our lives. Like David, recounting why we are standing in faith in you right now, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, I bless these as they go out, watch over us during this week, and Lord, bless our interactions with one another, build community with us, Lord, and help us to impact the community that you care so much about here, Lord, in St. Mary's County, in Calvert, in Southern Maryland, Lord Jesus. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Snack and yak out in the lobby there. Hug somebody's neck. We'll see you next week.